Thank you very much. Well, um, my name is Chi, or I call myself Chi at any rate. Uh, I'm a software developer, like many of you, and I'm also the author and illustrator of a strange little website called The Codeless Code. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of it, it's uh, basically a series of fables set in a temple of software developing monks and their masters. Uh, the style is based very loosely on Zen Buddhist lessons called koans. Uh, now, the purpose of the website is to educate people about software development. So every week I pick a topic, and like thread safety or refactoring, and I write about it. I write a little short story. And I could have uploaded these stories to a hosted blog somewhere, but in addition to being an illustrator, I kind of like to do a little bit of design work. So I figured I would create my own website and have it exactly the way I saw it. I had a vision of what I wanted that site to look like. And that pretty much brings me to my first point, uh, which is why are we here? Well, some of us are here because we're developers. And some of us are here because we're designers. But whether you're a developer or a designer, it boils down to pretty much one thing. Um, we love to make things. We're all makers here. And we a lot of careers out there that we could have chosen, but we chose this one. Makers are artists. I don't care if you can't draw a stick figure to save your life. If you're passionate about doing something, you want to do it really well, then you're an artist. Now, uh, you can be an artist who's a coder. You can be an artist who's a designer. You can be an artist who's a cook. As long as you bring that passion to your art. Now, you may not be a great artist now, yet, but part of art is learning. Part of art is self-improvement, which is another reason we're all here. Artists tend to be visionaries. Uh, the best artists, the most fun artists, are the ones that do things that nobody has done before. And even in our field, that's no, there is no exception. Um, for example, why are there so many UI frameworks out there? I mean, do we really need as many as there are? It's because once in a while, somebody gets a vision of how they'd want to build an application. And they go, all right, I'm going to go and I'm going to implement that vision. And I'm going to evangelize this because I really, really believe in this. Now, there's a good chance that a lot of other people are going to say, we don't need another UI framework. Uh, and that's pretty much normal. If you're a visionary, you're going to be running up against a lot of skeptics. And you're going to have a lot of arguments. And that's one of the reasons uh, why visionaries prefer to work alone. And a lot of developers probably know what I'm talking about. I'm a developer. A lot of times, I don't want to deal with arguing with somebody about my implementation approach. I just want to go ahead and do it. And that's one of the reasons some of us get into open source software is because we go, all right, I'm going to have my own little project, and I'm going to do things my way, and I'll show everybody. And that's fine up until a point. But a few years ago, I was leading a team of software developers in the enterprise, and I, I learned something. Uh, it was kind of surprising. Uh, really, for the big, important projects that are out there, uh, nobody gets there alone. Nobody does really big, interesting, important stuff. Because generally, the important stuff, the interesting stuff, is complicated, whether there's a lot on the client side, or a lot on the server side, or even just the realities of marketing and all the other unpleasant things that you might not want to do. Generally, you have to learn to let go of parts of your project and depend on other people. So the big important projects tend to have three types of individuals that we deal with, developers, designers, and users. Now, developers develop the application according to the specs that are given to them by the designers, all in the service of the users. So we think this is a nice, clean division of labor, and there really shouldn't be any problems. But unfortunately, these three are often in conflict with each other. Why? Well, let's break it down. Users, they're the most obvious ones. They need to accomplish tasks. They want applications that are easy to use, that are full-featured, that give them exactly the features that they do need without a lot of the garbage that they don't need. And they want it to run on three-year-old smartphones. Now, designers, unfortunately, have to satisfy many users. And the users that want feature A may not be the same as the users who want feature B. And there's a bit of contention between the two. And since designers say, look, we, we can't put everything in this application because we have to deliver something, they'll say, all right, we'll compromise. We'll come up with some kind of a compromise, which makes them unhappy because a lot of people don't want to compromise on their own vision. So designers aren't really always thrilled to do that. And in addition, they then need to go to the developers and say, I want you to implement this design exactly the way I've specified it so we can make these camps of users happy, but I want you to be flexible because I may want to change it in the future. 
and that's a problem that developers need to deal with. They need to deliver solid working code, but they also need to be able to change things over time. And sometimes the de designer will say, I just want a little tiny feature. The developer goes, that's going to take me hours and hours or days and days. So there tends to be a lot of conflict and a lot of strife between these groups. And for a workplace situation, the outcomes are usually not pretty. Um, conflict between groups does not help when we're trying to push systems out the door. So how can we avoid situations like this? How can we avoid having things get to the point where the police need to be involved? Well, understanding the jobs that we each do is actually a big step forward. If we can understand as developers the work that designers do, if we can understand as designers the work that developers do, we actually can stop a lot of these conflicts before they get to this point. So you might be saying, actually, why should I bother? Why should I bother understanding the work that my coworkers do? Isn't it enough that they just do it? Well, there are four big benefits to learning what the other side of the fence does. First, understanding others reduces your frustration. If you're asked to do something and you don't see the purpose in it, and it's busy work to you, you go, I, I hate my job so much. I don't want to do this anymore. For example, you bring in a junior developer and you tell a junior developer, I want you to go to this uh, site that we've put up and I want you to make sure that all the images have alt tags. Uh, I don't want to do that. Or you go to a senior developer and you say, hey, you know what? We're going to put in this undo feature in our mobile site. You go, what about a confirmation dialogue? Why do I have to have an undo feature? That's going to take me forever. Uh, but if you actually take a look at what's happening as a developer and say, oh, well, the reason I need to put those alt tags there is because we have a lot of blind users and they're using screen readers. You go, oh, wow, I'm not doing busy work. I'm helping blind people access the site. That, that's kind of cool. If you as a, as a designer are looking at your users and you realize, oh, users are making a lot of these common mistakes, I need to be able to have an undo feature. As difficult as it is for the developers to implement, then fine. I now understand why I have to do the things that I have to do. So it's less frustrating. Understanding others and expressing gratitude will actually increase your happiness. This is interesting. Research has proven this. When you understand that other people have your back, when you understand that what they're doing is actually making your life easier, it makes you happier because you know somebody's got your back. But also, when you express gratitude to them, when you say, thank you so much for taking care of that, thank you so much for arguing this one point with the users, you feel better about yourself because you feel like, I'm a good person. I just lifted somebody else's spirits. Yay me. So, third way that learning the jobs of our peers and understanding them is helpful to us is it actually improves all of our relationships. Empathy is the ability of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and going, gee, what would I feel if I were them? How would I see the world if I were them? Now, that's like flexing a muscle. If you learn that habit of putting yourself in somebody else's place at work, you get to use that same skill at home with your family and with your friends, and it will improve your relationships with family, friends, and even romantic partners. Whoa. So that's kind of cool. And the final way that we have a benefit from learning the jobs of others uh, is pretty obvious. It helps us coordinate with each other, makes our jobs easier because if I know as a designer that my developers want to use open source software for their widget sets, then when I design my system, I might not over specify the way things look. I might say, okay, we need a calendar widget there. Get a decent one as long as it can be styled. And if I'm a developer, I go, oh, well, I have to pick some UI toolkit. I know my designers are going to want to really have a lot of control over the look and feel of the elements. So why don't I get a UI toolkit that really gives me a lot of flexibility? And so the two communities help each other because they adopt each other's missions. Now, as I said, I'm a developer primarily, but I love design and I have a tremendous appreciation for design because I love art uh, as an illustrator. And I've always been fascinated by the different elements 
uh, that go into making art successful. So what I'd like to do today is to examine visual design a little bit, really more the, the graphical design portion as opposed to the user experience. And this is a maxim that I think pretty much captures what design means to me. To design interfaces that the user understands, interface designers must first understand the user. Ah, sounds sort of zen, doesn't it? Right? But what does it mean? I mean, it sounds profound, but what does it really mean? Well, am I talking about business requirements, understanding the user's business requirements? No, we're going deeper. One thing to recognize is that with every single advance in technology, the world is moving faster and faster. And we, who are contributing to the mobile applications that are out there, are putting the whole system into overdrive. People are multitasking like they have never multitasked before. They're making important decisions in cars and on airplanes and walking down hospital corridors. And they're making those decisions based on the information that they're getting through these tiny little mobile devices or their tablets. So what happens when those devices aren't showing them the information that they need to see or when they're showing them the information in a very poor way, in a way that even distorts the truth? What then? I mean, how bad can a bad design be, really, right? Well, we're going to take a quick look at three case studies, three actual situations where design of information failed. Case one, rocket science. Uh, Dr. Edward Tufte is a noted authority in information design. And he has a book called Visual Explanations, a beautiful book. I recommend that you take a look at it. Uh, in that book, he relates the following scenario. It actually happened. This is pretty near and dear to my heart. I, I remember when this occurred. Uh, the date is January 27th, 1986. It is one day before the launch of the American Space Shuttle Challenger. It's 33 degrees Fahrenheit, um, or actually it's 31 degrees Fahrenheit. It's minus one degrees Celsius at the launch site, and this is in Florida. It's unseasonably cold. The engineers that built the shuttle's rockets are very worried because the rockets have never lifted off at this temperature before. They are certain that the O-rings, which are part of the rocket, are going to fail at these low temperatures. They're desperate to stop the launch. So these engineers prepare a presentation for their managers. It's a 13 slide presentation that they give to their managers who will then take it to NASA management. All right, and here is the key slide. So, uh, and this was probably faxed to NASA management too, so you can imagine what it probably looked like. So a grid of teeny rocket pictures, and each rocket picture has on it, oh, you know, there's like a little temperature up there near the nose cone, and they're all ordered in uh, the sequence of the launches. Oh, and on each rocket, there's a really, really cute little graphical depiction um, of what the damage was, which, uh, eh, there's a key for that, but it's on another slide. So NASA management looks at this slide. They scratch their heads a little bit, and they go, oh, we're not convinced. Why weren't they convinced? And remember, the people that prepared this graph were not stupid. They were literally rocket scientists. Right? They were engineers. They were makers like us. So if they could make a rocket, surely they could make a graphic about rockets, right? And all the information really is up there in the graphic. So what happened? Why didn't they convince NASA management? Well, because the design is poor. See, this design failed its purpose. Its purpose was supposed to illustrate without any effort to NASA management that there was a correlation between low temperatures and a chance that there was going to be a big failure during the launch. NASA management needed to see that case blindingly obvious. Instead, what they saw was this. And the end result was this. 73 seconds after liftoff, the $2 billion space shuttle exploded, and all seven people on board lost their lives. The space shuttle program was suspended for almost three years during the investigation. That's the sort of thing that can happen when we get design wrong. Here's how Dr. Tufte would have presented that exact same information. Simple scatter plot, curve fit to them, there's the temperature, 31 degrees, 
boom, don't launch. There are a lot of really good graphics generating toolkits out there, a lot of things that will generate charts and bar charts and pie charts and whatever. Uh, there are Many of them are freely downloadable, they're easy to use. Who needs designers, right? Right? Well, thing is, we do. Because a graphic can be pretty, and it can be elegant, and it can be attractive, it can be interactive, and it can still be useless for a particular purpose. So one of the things that a designer will do, a good UI designer, will stop a good developer from using a good toolkit if the end result could be a bad decision. Case two, mixed messages. Another January day, this time 1992. Uh, there is an Airbus A320 that's on its final approach to a runway in Strasbourg, France, uh, coming in through thick clouds. The pilot of the Airbus has at his disposal the most technologically advanced cockpit that existed at the time. Look at that. Look at all of that, those wonderful displays. I mean, for 1992, this is, you know, really futuristic. You take a look at those, all those LEDs that are up there. So the captain dials into the autopilot and keys in number 33. He's trying to set a descent angle of 3.3 degrees. Unfortunately, what the captain didn't realize is that the system is in the wrong mode. So instead of keying in a gentle descent angle of 3.3 degrees, he accidentally enters a rapid descent rate of 3,300 feet per minute. Plane crashes into a mountain, 87 people are killed. Why didn't the pilot know? Why didn't the captain know that he'd made that mistake? Because this is how that information was displayed. There was a single display on that huge bank of LEDs that was used both for flight path angle at the top and for descent angle at the bottom in hundreds of feet per minute. Now imagine you're using this display and you're in a cockpit that's vibrating a little bit as you're going through the clouds. And the only difference between those two things that you're really attending to is the decimal point. One little tiny decimal point is probably going to be the only obvious thing. That's called a mode error, by the way. Good UI designers know not to reuse the same space for the same purpose, or for different purposes, if this is a likely confusion that would result. Case three, bad medicine. Uh, pretty much everybody in this room at some point or another is going to have to go to a hospital. It's sort of an unpleasant reality of life. And when you're at a hospital, you're looked at possibly by nurses, interns, even different physicians that may be on different shifts if you're doing an overnight stay at the hospital. And all of those individuals have to communicate. And when the physicians order medicine for you, they tend to do it through an order entry system, which is a, which is a computer system. So in 2005, a study was published in the Journal of the American Medical Association uh, about one hospital's state-of-the-art order system. And that a study identified 22 ways in which that state-of-the-art system resulted in patients actually getting the wrong medicine. Most of those issues were usability issues. Poor readability, bad screen design, confusing or complex workflows. Imagine yourself, if you're a nurse and you're pulling, or an intern, you're pulling a 24-hour shift at a hospital. You've got patients that require a lot of care. You've also got patients that are screaming, crying, possibly dying. Think of all those distractions. The last thing that you would want to do as a developer is to give those healthcare individuals a system that will tax their memories or make it easy for them to make mistakes. Dr. Tufte has this maxim, I think it's an important maxim, always ask yourself before you do something, what am I really trying to accomplish for the user? What is the user going to need this information for? Don't just grab a toolkit that works or that looks nice or come up with a screen design that's easy for you as a developer or that is nice for you as a designer, hey, I get to do this really, really nice thing, always consider the user. Always imagine yourself in the user's place. Now, 
We have been spending a fair amount of time in our culture devoted to the presentation of visual information. We've been spending hundreds, thousands of years perfecting the way to convey visual information and instructions to people. And collectively, we call that art. So what is art? What is it for? What does it do? Well, one of the things that art is supposed to do is to, is to inspire, is to entertain, certainly, is to educate. But in order for art to do any of these things, it has to communicate. This is not music. This is not music until somebody plays it and somebody hears it. So what is it? It's source code. It's meant to be compiled by a musician and then run. But what's the machine that runs it? The brain, specifically the mind. That's where the sounds become music. That's where dots of paint on a canvas or pixels on a screen become not just a picture, but all the ideas and emotions that we associate with that picture. That's where art happens. That's where cognition happens. It happens in the mind. Art is about taking the things that we, as artists, want to communicate and figuring out a way to encode that for our consumers. Art is about hacking the mind. It's about getting people to learn things even when they don't realize they're being taught. It's about getting people to feel things even when they don't think they're being persuaded. Art is about hacking the mind. And this is another way that developers and designers can begin to understand each other. Developers are hackers, and designers are hackers too. Developers, you use your skills every single day to get complex machines to do your bidding. Designers are no different. They're just working in wetware. Art is about hacking the mind. Now, I want to go into some of the ways in which art is used to hack the mind. So we're going to talk a little bit about visual design and how the visual design uh, in traditional art can be related to the visual design that we see in our screens. So this is going to be a little bit of a, a little tiny overview of some of the components of visual design. So first thing I want to cover is contrast. How do we get it so that users can even see what's on our site and understand it? And in order for you to be able to tell foreground from background, you've got to have some kind of contrast. Now, the ancient Greeks, when they did their pottery, they had two colors, black and not black. Right? So that's a color space of one bit. Nowadays, the good news is we have 24 bits worth of color. The bad news is we have 24 bits worth of color. And because of that, we end up with sites like this. Now, I look at that with my old eyes, and I go, it's kind of like reading through fog. Ironically, this is the website for a Google Reader app. Now, low contrast text may be fine for some of you youngins out there, uh, but low contrast text, as cool as it can look, actually can create a lot of problems for older users, and I'm sure we all have people in our family that use the web who are a little bit on the older side, users with poor vision, um, just people that just don't have great vision, um, people that are using their mobile devices in the glare of sunlight, low contrast, forget it, it's virtually illegible. Or if you're looking at a tiny mobile screen, it's actually a lot harder to perceive low contrast text on a phone than it is on a nice big 24-inch monitor. Uh, the people at the Contrast Rebellion website, by the way, have a lot to say about that. They say one of the reasons we tend to make these mistakes is because we as developers tend to be a little bit younger than our audience and tend to have a lot better equipment. We really should field test with real users with the kind of equipment that they're going to be using. But it's interesting, and the flip side of this is that Bold, high-contrast text can also create a problem. I have a, a friend who is a, a medical informatics expert, and she was working on a design for migraine sufferers, for a website for migraine sufferers. And she was studiously avoiding the high-contrast text because high-contrast text can create actual migraine attacks. 
in sufferers. And in people with photosensitive epilepsy, if you have stripes or checkerboards on your site, you can actually trigger an epileptic seizure. Uh, so always know your audience. Well, assuming we've gotten the contrast issue down, people need to be able to navigate our site. And if you've got a site that has a lot of information on it where users are scrolling and they're possibly scrolling down and scrolling down, you need to be able to make some kind of a structure apparent to them. And it's got to work at different form factors at different resolutions. They have to be able to very, very quickly see when they've hit a new section of their site, when they've hit a new topic on, their, on a blog, let's say. So how do we create structure to direct the user's eyes? There are actually artistic techniques for this. Painters have been doing this for many, many years. So the first way that we have to do this is by the position of elements. So take a look at this Renoir. A lot of people in that painting, but I bet you probably ended up looking here. Why? Well, because central elements dominate. I've got one square in the middle there. Your eyes are going to zoom in right on that. Even the two squares over there and the two squares over there, they can't command your attention is that one little guy in the middle. Putting things in the center dominates. If you're largely textual, by the way, things on the left-hand side tend to be encountered first because we read left to right, most of us. I, mean, I think at least in the Western world, read left to right. But if you're dealing with graphical elements on a site, we're going to always focus to the center. That's where our, that's where our vision is sharpest. Another obvious thing, um, perhaps, is size, but take a look at this. The center of this painting is right here. So you'd think that our eye might be drawn to this little girl here, but no, it's going to slide up to this gentleman. Why? Well, because he's bigger. Larger elements dominate. Evolutionary reasons, most probably, if you see something that's occupying a lot of your visual field, it's either very big or very close or possibly both. Uh, which, if it's a wild animal, eh, you probably want to pay attention to it. So uh, bigger is better. Also, it's probably why you know, your parents are intimidating because they're up there. You know. uh, we even use this principle in text. In the layout of text, illuminated manuscripts, you'll notice that every single section of an illuminated manuscript begins with text in really big letters. And they'll even use a drop cap, which is a really, really big letter. And that's all to say as you're flipping through this immense, beautifully illustrated book, hey, by the way, a new section starting right here. And we use these techniques even today, which is really cool. So here's a typical magazine article. Nothing else that distinguishes the structure here pretty much more than the, the text size here. The title is huge. And look down here, we have a drop capital and some capitalized text. Even the capitals at the beginning of sentences uh, in English probably are commanding our attention more because they're bigger. Uh, so the principle is still used a lot. Another principle, path. Okay, so this is a really nice Andrew Wyeth. Uh, first thing we're going to notice is the girl in the foreground. She's pretty obvious, but what's the next thing we're going to notice? Our eyes are going to follow her and her gaze probably right out to that farmhouse there. Uh, the painter was no slacker. He knew exactly what he was doing. Eyes can be led to a target spot. I can pretty much predict if I were tracking your eyeballs right now, most likely you would start here, you'd read this sentence, end up there, and then boom, launch right up to that square in the corner. So if you're a designer of an application and you need to somehow direct a user to related or important information, this is a way that UI designers will do it. They will structure those elements so that the eye will naturally follow those elements to where they need to go. If you've ever been on a website where you've been hunting for the thing to click to buy an item, and you could go, where's the buy button? Where's the buy button? Designer failed. The designer should have been funneling your gaze right to that buy button. Another way we create structure is grouping. Uh, you probably have seen this before, creation of, of man, here's Adam, here's God. And we tend to think of these two figures. We tend not to notice the fact that God is actually surrounded by a whole bunch of angels. Why? Well, compositionally, uh, they're all in one group. And when you take 
a bunch of tiny little things and put them together, you end up with cognitively one large thing. And again, probably for evolutionary reasons, you know, if you have a few scattered cows in a meadow, that's not threatening. If you have a whole bunch of cows that are all clumped together and they're heading towards you, that's probably very threatening. Uh, so you might want to notice clumps of things. So they have a visual weight. But as designers, you can take advantage of this. So for example, let's say I have nine buttons that I need to show on an app. App. But six of the buttons really thematically go together, and these two thematically go together, and this guy's kind of off on his own. Well, then I can structure my application that way so that my user can chunk these things through proximity alone, and it makes the user remember, oh, I got to go down to the right, and then I'll hunt around for the right button. But I know it's down towards the right because that's where all those things are. Yet another um, arsenal, uh, weapon that uh, designers have in their arsenal is tone. This is related to contrast, but it's, it's sort of subtly different, so I want to give it a separate treatment. Take a look at this Escher, uh, Escher's Waterfall. Notice that uh, we have a foreground and a background, and the foreground is a pretty complex scene that has all sorts of shades of gray. And the background is a pretty complex scene, too, which has all sorts of shades of gray. But yet, you can tell the foreground from the background. How? Because Escher is hacking our minds. He knows that as human beings, we're used to seeing things in daylight in such a way that the more distant objects are hazier, more washed out. So what he does is he washes out the background. We divide up the world by distance. Again, further things, closer things. The distinction between them is very important. But things also at the same level of distance will tend to look the same. This little bar here, you probably might perceive this as a sort of a 2001 monolith sitting on a, on a plane receding off into the horizon. It's just gray. But we are really attuned to providing some kind of structure onto hues and tones like that. So uh, let me actually just show you an, a website that makes pretty good use of this. So here we have two sections of the website. So we've got a big bright area here, bright things advance. So we've got this nice area of content that comes forward. The dark things tend to recede. They're a little bit more obscure. Um, and this almost behaves like a daytime and a nighttime. And if we take a look at the nighttime seat here, look at nighttime uh, side here, look at what's happening here. We've got these buttons, which are the major headers. They're brighter, so they advance towards us, like at night. Brighter things are generally closer things, darker things, more obscure things, or more distant things. And so these headers here advance. The menu items themselves, they recede a little bit into the distance. And on the daytime side here, this is almost the reverse. You have this menu item up here, or this menu up here, and it's got a subtly grayer background, so it recedes a little bit. So it's a, a pretty nice use of, of different tones on one website. One nice thing about tone is you can use tone as a grouping strategy. Things that have a similar tone tend to go together. So when you're looking at this particular slide, you might see 16 squares for a, an instant. Um, you might even perceive it as one big square, but you're probably also going to perceive it as three different regions. That's how, that's how useful tone is. And a good designer will do that to break up what might otherwise be this big, monotonous block of stuff. So here's a website. We can take a look at it. It takes uh, a lot of what we've learned or just talked about so far. Uh, it uses proximity here to group these buttons and these buttons so that we can say these go together and these go together. It's not just all spread out across the top. So we can use a little bit of chunking. Uh, obviously, we've got our center area here is bright. It comes forward. Uh, and the dark things, this is a dark background, so it's almost like a light in the darkness, it's coming forward and the darkness is receding. We take a look at the center here. These buttons all have the same tone, so they kind of go together, but notice this guy here. This one's darker, has a little bit more contrast, so we attend to it a bit more. And this is a fairly elegant design. It's sparse, it's, it's easy to navigate, and the thing that makes it a good design is you don't even notice that it's a design. I mean, good design is like good code. It just works. One thing to remember, though, um, everything in a UI is important in some context, but you can't emphasize everything. Uh, if you do, if you overuse these techniques, you end up with a mess. If everything is emphasized, then nothing is. 
Okay, so we've talked a bit about cognition and directing the user's eye and getting the user to understand mentally how the site is laid out. What about emotion? Art, as I said, is all about communicating emotion. Can we use those same techniques, hacking the minds of our users? Heck yeah. One of the first emotions that we're going to want to instill in our user is a sense of confidence. We want them to understand that our site is secure. We want them to believe that our site is well built and stable. So how do we instill confidence? There are three different ingredients that contribute to a user's perception, I believe, of a site uh, and how robust it is. Uh, alignment, symmetry, and balance. And if you take a look at this particular painting, you will notice that this does not look like a very safe building. So why doesn't it look safe? Why does it look like a rickety, unsafe building? Because all three of these principles are violated. The elements are not in alignment. There's a lot of crookedness going on. There's no symmetry. And there are some sections that stick out like they're way out of balance. I wouldn't want to live there. We as human beings are kind of hardwired to judge each other physically. We judge physical beauty. Um, it just is, unfortunately, it's, again, it's sort of a side effect of, of, of evolution because physical symmetry is generally associated with health and genetic fitness. And so that carries into our assessment of cars and houses and websites. Designers know about this. And for many, many years, designers have been using different principles for laying out websites. And some of you may have heard of the golden rectangle or the golden ratio. You may have heard of the rule of thirds. And these are all design patterns. These are actual, from a developer standpoint, design patterns that UI designers use in order to come up with more aesthetically pleasing layouts. When you have alignment being obeyed, the site feels pleasing, refined. It looks like somebody put thought into it. When you violate it, even just a little bit, it goes, uh, I don't know, it kind of looks like somebody threw that together in a weekend. Uh, now, in this particular thing, I actually only moved two of the squares. I nudged one a little bit to the side and one of them a little bit down. The end result is the entire grid looks crooked. That's all it takes. We're really good at noticing when things are out of alignment. Um, and it, it makes us feel unsettled. It makes us feel uneasy. And this is one of the reasons why UI designers tend to be so opinionated about using the style sheets. Uh, you know, say, please, developers, use these style sheets. Use this HTML. Uh, I've designed this site to work on a whole variety of form factors, but it's not going to work properly. Because how many people have ever used a website where when you resize it, when you look at it on a tablet or you look at it on a mobile phone, all of a sudden all the elements are completely off kilter? Right? I mean, that has to have happened to pretty much everybody in this room. And that's a sign of, again, a bad responsive design. And when that alignment is off, ugh, it just mm, it doesn't look good. It looks like people forgot to do things. Um, OK, so much for confidence, but what about other emotions? For example, uh, I might be doing a site for wedding invitations. I want my site to look sophisticated. I might be doing a site uh, for a bank. I want my site to look official. How do, I, how do I instill those senses, those emotions in my users? OK. Once again, we look to art. First weapon, color. Color and imagery, as a matter of fact. Uh, Edward Munch's The Scream, uh, one of my favorites. This is how I look when I see a website done in Comic Sans. Um, this is. You will notice we've got a figure in the foreground who has a very unhealthy skin tone. Uh, we've got an orange sky which is fighting with the blue of the water. There's even blue in the sky that it's fighting with. The whole experience of this, from purely from a color standpoint, is, is unsettling. Um, now, developers tend to see color in very, very strict, rigid ways. Uh, red, green, and blue are our three primaries. Red is bad, green is good, blue is a hyperlink usually. What's to know? Okay. Um, designers aren't like that. Uh, designers, they look at the codes and they're seeing the codes on a whole different level. 
Uh, to designers, color is about mood. Color is, is about connotation. What colors are in this year? What colors are out? How do they translate? Now, which mood, by the way, does depend on your audience. Uh, we're here at a European conference. Most likely, everybody's going to be dealing with an international audience for their applications. So let's take a look at this uh, very innocuous Van Gogh. Uh, it's red. What is red? Well, if you're in the United States, red is a color that's associated with passion and love. But in parts of Southern Africa, red is actually a, a color of mourning and grief. It's a color you'd wear to a funeral. Whereas in China, red is a color that's associated with good fortune and luck and money. And you would never wear red to a, a funeral in China. So. Before you choose a color, you have to think about who your audience is and what they're going to be taking away from it, what the connotations are. Even if we confine ourselves to the Western world, when one color, blue, that same color can have different connotations. It can connote holiness. It can connote calm. It can connote sadness, all depending on the imagery. So those little background images that are chosen, those can be pretty important, too, in, in setting the emotional tone. Um, there's a lot that's been written about color theory, so much, and, and the volume of, of information is such that if you have any takeaway, it should be this. Color is hard. Doing color is difficult, and that's one of the reasons we tend to leave it to graphical designers to choose color combinations. If you have bad color combinations, they can be nauseating to the user, unsettling to the user. The user may not even know why they find those color combinations unsettling. They just do. And they'll, they'll come away feeling like your sight is icky and unpleasant. I don't know why. I don't want to go there anymore. Um, one thing I want to also talk about uh, before we leave the scream is the way that the scream uses lines and shapes. Now, uh, if you take a look at this one, Munch, Munch did actually like five different versions of it. This is a pure black and white version. Uh, I think it's a, a lithograph. And look at the lines in this. I mean, there's no orange, there's no blue, there's no sickly pallor, but we still get a sense of unease. And if, and if those of you would like, sort of take your thumb and sort of block out the central figure and just leave the rest of the composition, it's still not a happy place. Uh, this is still an uneasy composition because of the waviness of the lines. Very, very queasy. Uh, designers know this. Uh, so, for example, let's say a designer is putting together a website uh, for uh, a punk clothing store. Uh, they're more likely to use brutal lines, which are suggestive of sharp things like knives and metal spikes. Uh, but if they're coming up with a mobile site for uh, an outdoorsy type store, they might use rough lines, which uh, connote natural textures like tree bark and stone. You saw probably at the beginning of this section that I use different fonts for the different moods. No accident there. One of the biggest ways that designers can set a mood is through font. Designers can make a site seem more human, less technical, and more friendly by using a handwriting font. There are tons of handwriting fonts out there, and each one also has a different feel. We associate different fonts, by the way, with not only different times and places because of the context in which we see them. We see a font being used, for example, in a 1920s or 1930s uh, movie or a Poirot episode. But we also associate fonts with things like highway signs and the fonts that are used on the money that we uh, spend or, for example, um, the ones that we see on wedding invitations. So that when we use those same fonts in another setting, the brain can actually be tricked into, remember, remember how you felt the last time you were looking at that font. So designers will actually use our memories to hack our brains. That's, that's pretty clever. The last topic that I'm going to cover uh, is actually the most important one. Uh, it's about a design element that is so important that we don't notice it uh, when it's there, but we do notice it when it's not there. Um, space. It's very, very important in Chinese landscape art for presenting a sense of calm.
Okay, in closing, I just want to reiterate the fact we, we should always remember that designers and developers are both bringing very, very valuable things to the table. Designers uh, are hackers, just as developers are, but ultimately, our goal is, is not to produce a slick UI or a, a fancy UI. Our goal is to serve the needs of the user. They're the most important element of our applications. Thank you very, very much. Wow, thank you very much. Um, actually, we have, uh, I think, some time for questions. Gee, are you happy to take some questions? Do you have any? I, hit, I exactly did the 45 minute I haven't realized how designers are cool, you know? Hacking minds like that. Um, there was one question. Um, just just wait microphone. for a microphone. Oh. Okay, I'll just take that. Thanks. Yes? On one of the last slides, there was a question uh, that the websites use the, a space between the paragraphs the, uh, and the printed text doesn't, does, does not uh, need it. Why is that? Oh, oh, <laughs> because that, I was actually presenting that wall of text not thinking any of you were actually going to read it, but OK. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the reasons that we believe that mobile sites uh, have, continue to this day to have, by the way, because this goes back to the original NCSA Mosaic browser, separated paragraphs by spaces, uh, rather than the more traditional way you'll see a paragraph in a, in a book, which is where it's on the next line, but just sort of indented slightly. Well, because in a website, uh, you're generally going to be a lot of doing a lot of scanning. You're going to be doing a lot of scrolling. And that break, that physical break of white space, is a lot easier to spot than a little tiny indentation, a little notch that's in there. Uh, so yeah, that's that's most likely the reason. Yes? I'll get you the mic. Sorry. <laughs> um, how do you, do you have a preference for how you actually find out what the needs of the users are? Like testing, user testing, analytics, interviews, yeah. OK, well, I'm, again, sort of a disclaimer. I'm not a designer. I, I'm just a big fan of designers. Uh, but we do, uh, in the shop where I work, they do usability testing. Uh, and that is actually going to be the most important element. Uh, nowadays, there's, uh, there are so many resources out there to put an application in front of a user. If you're really serious about it, you can track their eye movements. Uh, you can see exactly where they're going to. And of course, I would, str I would strongly also recommend always test your applications in a variety of different form factors to make sure that the designs hold up. Uh, that, for example, proximity uh, gets distorted. Like I said, other things get distorted when you resize things. So there's some there's common usability stuff that you don't even need the user. You don't even need the user in the room for. But for the rest of the stuff, yes, definitely work with real users. I would say. Any other questions? Oh, a oh, couple of them. Hello. Hi. Uh, so suppose somebody from this room would like be, to become a person like you. So uh, an engineer. Well, why with, would you want that? Uh, 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 <laughs> an engineer with a knack for design, right? Oh. Uh, a design fan. Where do you start? Um, well, I would have to say that I love art, and I have ever since I was a kid. Uh, my mom. Uh, was an art teacher for my school. Hi, mom. Uh, I threw in a hi, mom once in a while there. Uh, and she uh, basically had me looking at art at a very, very early age. Now, even if you're coming to it sort of late, uh, there must be some art that you enjoy. Uh, and I would say that learning the principles of design uh, and how they're used in art goes a long way towards making what would otherwise be a fairly dry topic a lot more palatable. Uh, that's that's pretty much what I would suggest. Uh. Okay, so um, um, in most cases you presented, uh, you assume that we all understand uh, that, for example, something is out of alignment or it doesn't feel right. But from my experience, there are people who doesn't feel that, especially some developers. And what is your <laughs> and then you have to. What are their names? 
then I'll, you, I'll talk to them. Then you have to <laughs> ask this person to implement this, and you know how do how do you know you don't want to say just do it like that, and this person will not see the difference if he do it wrong. So. Do you have an experience how to deal with that? Um, you mean developers that literally will look at something that's crooked and go, looks fine to me? That, that kind of thing? <laughs> I mean that, for example, you give uh, the person a design, you say, does implement it, mm -hmm. and he do it wrong. Do you have an experience? If well, I mean, again, I think what you have to cultivate in any person on your team is... Uh, compassion for the user and the realization that the things that may not be important to you as a developer may in fact be quite important to a user and their experience at the site. Now the crookedness thing, that's really kind of a tricky one because maybe the users don't care about it and it is kind of a subtle issue. Uh, to me, it's also, I mean, there's also a pride issue. Uh, if you're a company, if you're a developer working for a company, your company is putting out that product. That product is the face of the company. That's what people see. That's how they judge the company. Um, not by the company website, but by the thing that they're holding in their, in their hand and seeing on their mobile phone. Yeah, uh, so the thing that they're seeing on their mobile phone. So uh, to a certain extent, you might want to appeal to them in, in that way and say, well, that looks kind of cruddy. Uh, you know, do you really feel like you want to be associated with this thing that looks kind of cruddy and jumbled? Um, you know, in the end, some people say, I don't care, it's a paycheck. Uh, and that's kind of a that's much longer topic <laughs> to discuss is strategies. But uh, anybody that wants to continue to talk about this stuff and, and any advice that I have, uh, we can actually do it, you know, at the break or whatever. Just come find me. Uh, you won't be able to shut me up, I, I swear to you. You really, I love talking about this. Um, any other questions? <laughs>